Right, so today, everyone, uh, we're doing the third Q&A for Glass Civilizations 4. Um, this is the, the calm before the storm, the before the full 1.0 release of Glass Civilizations 4. Uh, so chiefly, we're looking for questions related to the currency of the game, uh, possibly some, you know, after 1.0 plans, maybe. But just generally, whatever's on your mind. Um, obviously, it should go without saying, but uh, we expect some... You know, maturity, don't go and, like, start uh, going with, like, uh, insults or, like, a lot of uh, swearing, etc. That, that, that's for later. That's for um, when we're not recording. So <laughs> try and keep it clean, keep it safe. And uh, we'll try to get to as many questions as we can. We have some questions which were submitted earlier. Uh, if anyone who submits questions wants to ask them live, that's fine as well. These are more like supposed to have uh, questions between downtime and to... Just see what people generally want to ask, so people can like, hey, where did that feature set up before we we go with this? So, um, introductions first. Uh, to those people who don't know, I'm Schism Navigator Henry. I'm the community lead on Glyph Solutions Four. Uh, then we have uh, Derek. Hello, uh, I'm the lead designer on Galactic Civilizations Four. And then we have uh, Unicracken or Chat. Fine. <laughs> Hello, I'm Uni. I am the producer for Galactic Civilizations 4. Uh, and also we have, we have a couple of Sodakins looking as well. We have, I see Yarlin in the chat. Uh, I'm, sure, I'm sure he has lots of questions for us today. Uh, so, we have 24 people in the audience right now. Um, first come, first serve, pretty much. So, the way this works in Discord, those who don't know yet, is you should see a little hand icon in Discord. When you click it, your hand will be raised. Uh, if we, we don't get your question first, don't worry, keep the hand up, but let us know what order people want to raise their hand. When we get to you, uh, we will basically have a main question and then you can do a follow-up question. Uh, we may have more questions. You, you can raise your hand again later as well. Uh, this will be running for roughly an hour and we'll get to as many as we can. So first up, uh, Drizzen just raised their hand. So Drizzen, I'll invite you to speak. Hello. Hey, appreciate uh, all you guys are doing for the uh, for the uh, the series here. Uh, quick question, um, <laughs> and and my apologies if uh, if you can't answer this, but typically we've seen with uh, with organizations that have gone with Epic, there's been a one year exclusivity, uh, and then it's opened up. Um, are you allowed to tell us how long that exclusivity lasts? Oh, Tristan, coming right out of the gate with the hard questions. I, yep. I see how you are. There's not even a little ease into it kind of question. Um, no, we will be exclusive with Epic for the foreseeable future, but uh, we're not talking about you know specific dates or anything like that right now. All right, thanks. Sorry, I couldn't answer your question. And by the way, while I'm while I'm talking, a special thanks out there to Luther Vian, if I'm pronouncing his name right. He actually dialed into his computer and he showed me the issue where the AI was using military ships to survey anomalies. So super appreciate him letting me come in and showing it to me. And he, you know, had this huge game going where he could find a specific case for it and helped us track it down. So while I'm talking, special thanks to him. Uh, did you have a follow-up question, Tristan? No, I did not. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so, anyone's got a question, or do we go through the listed questions from before? I don't see any hands up yet. I think Stor had a, a couple of questions. If you want to ask him in text chat, we can do. Uh, yeah, I see Jad also been asking about Steam. Um, okay, so let's go for one of the pre submitted questions. Um, Right, so Bass has asked, what types of combat changes do you plan on making in future updates? Um, there's a couple things. Um, the, the biggest one that's probably surprising to the, the group here is I, I think that the object-based ability, so the ability to fire missiles and to heal your fleets and to... Um, to spawn a new ship and those kind of things. I think they're way underused. I think there's a lot of potential there that we haven't really tapped into. Uh, the big thing that I would love to see to affect the battle system is I would like different kinds of battle attacks to happen through those uh, object-based orders. So it used to be, when we initially set it up, there was a tactic that you would select every time you started a battle. So when you started a battle, um, it would come up and you would have to choose like one of several tactics and your tactics would be based on the text that you have. But it was just... 
Like when you have a game that has, you know, 20 battles happening that turn, it was a lot to go through every time. So we, we ended up taking them out. I don't want to have to choose a battle tactic every time we do it. We played with some other things. Maybe I set the tactic as default on the fleet, and then I can change it if I want to. But none of them felt very good. All felt like, you know, kind of cumbersome. But one of the things that we came up to was actually Carrie's idea late in the process was, why don't we have those as object-based abilities? So you could do a object-based ability for special kind of attack forms, like a skirmish, which is one of the tactics we had before. A skirmish just would go in and do some light damage and then get out fast. So you wouldn't fight the battle all the way through. You would Your ships would flee as soon as they started taking any damage. You're very unlikely to lose any ships in a skirmish, but you also wouldn't do a lot of damage to the other person. And then a tactic that was the opposite, which was you know a suicide run, where you would extend the length of the battle so that um, you would do more damage to both. You would almost certainly die, but you would do a lot more damage to the opposing fleet. And we took those things out. There's support for them in engine because it wasn't fun. And when Carrie said, hey, we could tie those to battle action so you could actually be looking at your fleet and you could say, you know, I want to, instead of firing a missile, I want to skirmish that fleet. I want to um, do a suicide run on that fleet. That feels a lot better. So I would love to see that kind of stuff get in after release. Hmm. There was uh, there was also a follow-up question specifically about different combat options. Um, I think that one of the things that uh, we're seeing with this is it's it's. I think combat in like a forest game is one of those where to find the fun, and something which will probably be an ongoing element of development even long after release. Yeah, I was one of the things Brad said. Uh, I talked about this a little bit in Discord yesterday, but one of the things that Brad said was. Whenever whenever any mistake is made around Galsev, it's typically in thinking this sounds like a really good idea, but when you magnify it by 80 planets and 200 fleets, like that idea really doesn't work anymore. And that's exactly what this case was for the battle tactics. Like It's really cool. And when I have four fleets that I'm working with, it, it sounds right. But once I magnify it up, it just it didn't feel good anymore. So that's why you have to kind of find the fun, especially in a game that covers this much scale. I, yeah, I think it has been said before about... Um... Not so much being dismissive, but like there are different games, different scale of what you're trying to do. Uh, Galaxy 4 is, well, Galaxy 4 in general is definitely a strategic game, not a tactical game. But it's it's like finding those things which are simple enough and d- easy enough to understand, intuitive, that it's fun in the game without bogging it down at that scale. So that's going to be an ongoing element of development, probably. I, 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 would, I would guess. I would speculate to myself. <laughs> Don't take my word too seriously, guys. I'm, I'm just the idiot here. So... <laughs> Next up, um, see if any hands up yet. Uh, no one has the yet. So there was, there was a question from uh, Slaji. Um, they were asking if you could explain the siege mechanic. Okay. Uh, there are two different sorts of sieges, one when you're attacking a colony and one when you're attacking a core world. If you're attacking a colony, it is pitting the attack of the military ships that are attacking that colony against the um, planetary defense of the colony. It will always win, and this is in both cases. It just The question is always how much time is it going to take? And we have min and maxes on the time so that you both can't bring a super ship and take a colony in a turn. And no matter what you do, you can't um, have to spend 50 turns trying to take some little colony in there just to protect ourselves from things that we haven't balanced too well. Um, so it's military attack versus a planetary defense. There's some modifiers for resistance and things like that that play into it. Um, the The biggest modifier on the defensive side is the resolve of all of the units that are on that planet. So the higher the resolve, the that they every point of resolve gets counted as a point of planetary defense. So if you have... Um, and a colony, of course, you only have one citizen and you have six resolve, and the base planetary defense of a colony may be 10, so 10 plus 6 is 16, and that's what the attack has to chew through before um, you take that planet. Planetary defense, once it's damaged, heals back slowly, um, but it is it does retain that damage. It's basically hit points for the planet, so that if the siege is broken off and you start a new one, um, you know the planet will already be... Um, will already be injured effectively, so it'll be faster. Um, the only thing is there's still always that minimum in place. So even if the planet is almost dead, um, uh, even if and I start a new siege on it, it's still going to take the minimum of, I think, it's three turns. For core worlds, it's the um, 
resolve of the soldiers and the attacking transport versus the same thing on the defending side, the planetary defense of the um, planet that's being sieged, uh, which comes from a lot of it comes from the resolve of all the citizens that are there. But putting multiple transports together with soldiers with good resolve on it will dramatically increase that time. Um, I had a planet, it took me 30 turns. I looked at the siege bar and it was going to be 30 turns to be able to uh, take it. I thought, oh my gosh, what in the world is going on here? And I looked, and just because I wasn't paying attention, I had put a pacifist with one resolve as the soldier on the ship, and he was. It was the worst invasion in history. So it was still sitting at that maximum limit. Otherwise, it would have been even longer um, to go ahead and take it. Uh, actually, this actually reminds me as well, though, of, of previous questions, previous discussions we've had about. Um tutorials and like because people people wonder like how does the mechanic work exactly so something we have talked about before in regards to updating the way that our little little helper bot works uh but also yeah. personally i i would say again this is my this is my pitch here is that i think that one of the things that we we could think about doing is having some kind of in-game like codex or something that's probably going to be like after launch though but i do think that at some point having some kind of like more in-depth tutorials people can just go to like ah that's what that does etc uh, although I know that Brad has uh, obviously updated his walkthrough as well, so we'll probably have more versions of that later as well. Um, yeah, I try to, like, when you look at the Siege button, so we're trying mm. to use the nested tooltips as much as possible. So when you mouse over the button, you can see a Siege, and you mouse over the word Siege, uh, it will describe some of these things in there. So if there's ever cases where people are confused, please let me know. I did, in particular for Sieges, because I knew it were confusing for a lot of people, try to put as many tooltips around them so that players could learn. I definitely prefer that than putting a tutorial in, which a lot of people will bypass, or putting a Wikipedia out there. I love Wikipedia, but a lot of people aren't going to check it, where I feel like the tooltips are super helpful for everybody, especially in Galsiv 4, where we have the ability to nest them, so you can go deeper and deeper and deeper, depending on how much information you want to see. Okay. Um, there was also a bit of a follow-up there about uh, the siege stuff. So, um... Tid asks, are there plans to improve the resistance system? I don't have anything direct. I will say that I don't think the soldiering bonuses are doing much of, of anything at all. I think they're just too minor in the scope of everything else that is happening here. So they could use a rebalance to go through and make sure that, you know, if I bought a policy that gives me plus 10% soldiering, I should be able to feel a difference there when I go and take planets. And right now, I don't think that's that's working too well. Um, I'm not as worried. I feel like we did balance out the resistance side of it, so the amount of planetary defense coming from the resolve of those citizens. It feels pretty good and does make me think about putting col uh, colonists with high resolve on worlds I think are going to be disputed or uh, keeping high resolve colonists on my core worlds that may be threatened and putting my low resolve guys on star bases and things like that. Um, so I felt like that part feels good, but on the soldiering side especially, I feel like it's weak, and we, we should do some additional work to balance that out. Okay. Um, oh, quick, just quick note, people, everyone here. Um, even though we are using the uh, hand raise request system, um, does not mean you have to use the mic, if you, but it does let us know who to ask, uh, to who to take a question from next. Um, oh, Chad, did you have something to say? No, not yet. Okay. Uh, so next up is, Cycl is uh, Cyclonus, like to speak. You can speak on the mic, or you can just ask a question in text. No problem. My question is more about the weapon types with ships. It seems to have changed from Galactic Civ 3, and I'm having a hard time trying to figure them out. They used to all have different ranges, damages, and rates of fire. And it seems like that has been changed to uh, the, all, almost all of them are the same. Yeah, we normalized the range on the weapons and the rate of fire because it was hard for, for more casual players to appreciate why they were and weren't going to lose a battle. So the, the classic case that I saw that made me go, oh my gosh, yeah, we need to fix this, was I would get into a battle where I had um, double the attack, I had better defenses than the opponent did, and I would get in and I would do my fast attack, and I'm you know, playing on a big map. So I'm not going to sit and watch all the battles. I, I don't watch very many at all, but I would just set it to attack. All right, my fleet should be able to kill your fleet. Every, I'm better in every single stat. And then I saw that I lost. In fact, they didn't lose a single ship in it. And that kind of swing is very frustrating to 
um, more casual players that don't want to go into the spreadsheet minutia of it. It's interesting to say, well, I had really they had really long wing rep, range weapons, so I need to do something to prevent against that. That's kind of cool. If the game does a really good idea, a, a really good job of communicating all that to the player, and we weren't doing a good job of it, so it was just a mystery mechanic, or it was just frustrating at the end. So I normalized all those values so that when the player saw his, yeah, you know, we're going to win, we're going to lose stats, they were reliable. It, follow-up question that is, I'm guessing that's why a lot of the ship modules for weapon types for from Galactic Civilization 3 aren't in the game. Like the rates of fire, uh, increased range, damage, and all that stuff that you could use to boost your other weapon types. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So those, uh, honestly, they initially left because I wanted to get the ships to be a lot simpler so that they would be more easy to balance. But as we got into that case where, like I say, rate of fire would kill them or uh, increased range would kill them, then yeah, we had to get rid of all those modifiers, that kind of things, because the UI wasn't doing a good job of communicating any of it. Uh, thanks, Glennis. I'll be no back problem. down. Uh, next up is Divine Wrath, but uh, before we get to them, I do have a fun question to ask, uh, which is, uh, do you like the Yore? <laughs> <laughs> I like the Yore. Uh, I don't play much of them. I, like, I play a little test game of it to make sure the stuff is balanced and working. It's mostly because Yarlin loves the Yore, uh, and as soon as there's somebody here at the company that's playing, like, they have their favorite faction, and they always play as that faction. Usually, I don't pay as much attention to them, because I know they're going to get taken care of. Um, so, Brian Yarlin is the guy who screams at me when, you know, something is going wrong with the Yore, and they're not powerful enough, and they should kill everything on turn two. Um, <laughs> kind of stuff. Uh, Carrie is the big fan of the Mimots, so of course the Mimots are powerful, because I'm not going to tell Carrie no, I'm no fool. Um, so we have a couple people like that. So I play a little bit of the Yor. I like the Yor. I like that the Yor feel different than the other factions. Faction differentiation is really uh, important to me. So when I play them, I'm thinking about different things. Um, so so I, I like them for that perspective. I, I the ships say, are pretty. Go ahead, Schism. Sorry. I was going to say, uh, personally, uh, I am also a fan of having more uh, robotic or... Uh, AI races in general. I do feel like we're missing probably like another like major one, more less quote unquote evil than the than the Yor, maybe. Yeah, but, we had uh, played with one. I won't talk about it here because it may come out later, but there was another yeah. synthetic race that we were planning early on that has some really cool art for it, but uh didn't end up um getting in. Because they were just a little too weird. Like the we have to change so much stuff to make them work. But I agree Maybe with someday. you. More synthetic races would be good. I know. I know that if Rob's here. He'll he'll be asking for dolphin races. Actually, I do intend to make a dolphin race, but it won't be an official one yet. Maybe <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> so uh, we'll get to divine then. So uh, divine, you can either invite to speak. You can either ask in chat, or you can use the uh, no mic chat. And uh, you're saying you'll live you'll long live the your. Okay, so Divine's question is, uh, any hints on what kind of DLC or expansions are planned in the near future? I'm just trying to get this game out in five days. <laughs> uh, so, no, no, no. Hey, we have some ideas for, you know, what's coming down the pipe. And I think there's lots of potential in Galsip 4 to just keep adding on to it. It's a good, firm base to start from. And a lot of fun um, here already. But lots of directions that we could go with it. But nothing that we're dropping here. Except By the for, way, we're talking. Uh, except say, for what course. you're going to talk about, your dolphin race again, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, that's confirmed. That's going to be no. uh, the first patch. <laughs> um, talking about the Yor, Brad made one of the changes to it that I really like, which is just that Yor are just happy, just generally happy. I think the only thing I'm looking at them that they don't like is having non Yor on their planets. <laughs> like they don't like <laughs> other people. <laughs> but outside of that's that, you could do funny. anything to the Yor. Tax them as high as you want. Like they're. Eh. Whatever. They'll get along. Uh, do you have a follow-up question, Divine? We'll be in chat for that. Uh, find about this type in. That would be a big question. Oh, no. <laughs> was, no. <laughs> was, okay, I'll oh leave it to the audience. Okay. I was typing it up. 
Uh, so next up, um, Dipsy2299, invite to chat. Uh, you can either, again, ask on mic or you can just post it in the uh, no mic chat or questions. Uh, Dipsy. I think we lost them. No, I said they're typing in no mic chat right now. Oh. And Lutherian has also queued up for ask a question next. Let's we'll see what Gypsy types. And Tid is also typing. Hey, Chad, what's your favorite uh, civilization in the game? What do you usually play as? Um, I actually just really like humans. I'm very boring. Um, Which humans, though? The, the Alliance or the Resistance? The Alliance. Ah, that is I, I mean, boring. that's... I, yeah, I'm, I'm very boring. I, I always play as that kind of faction in every space game. Uh, so, uh, Gypsy's question is, when will the map editor be included? Uh, there are no plans to add a map editor. So there's no campaign um, in Gaussip 4. So we're, we really work on the map generation, the programmatic map generation, more than putting out a map editor for it. So no time soon. I'm not saying we won't ever do it, but no time soon. It's not coming out in the next month or first patch or anything like that. There was also one of the questions that was uh, asked before in, in the before the event as well. Um, Gypsy, do you have another follow-up question? In the meantime, I'll ask one of the other ones in the... Uh, another fun question. This was a question on Facebook. It was, um, <clears throat> are Dragonola or Fugboy the same person? Are clones a mysterious overlord named Brad? <laughs> I Your swear from please. how much work that guy does, there must be three of them running around somewhere. Uh, he's... Uh, of course, been in, deep in the AI code on Gaussian 4 and working on the design side and helping with balance and play testing. And that's just one of the things we have going on at Stardock. I, I've heard rumors that there's an entire software company around here somewhere um, that he also is heavily involved in. So um, I've only seen one Brad at a time, but uh, I wouldn't put it past him to have clones somewhere. You never see Dragon I'm always Lord worried. Boy in the same room. That's right. <laughs> I, I'm always worried that I'm going to walk into the wrong room here and uh, find a giant room full of like clone vats. <laughs> we put the other chads as well. That's uh... <laughs> uh, I don't see a follow-up question from Gypsy yet. Um... Oh yeah, one of the questions that was asked before as well uh, was about the law question. Uh, what's the law behind the precursor sentinels? So, in my mind, at least, Brad's the lore holder for everything Galsiv. Of course, he created this game, you know, this universe 25 years ago. So he's really the guy that should answer that question. But in my mind, um, the precursors created these sentinels as ways to uh, guard the worlds and to prevent warfare. Um, if they were done right in game, they would only attack civilizations that were at war. And if you were at peace with everybody, they would totally leave you alone um, because they're supposed to be out there watching for um, violent civilizations and, and bringing peace to the, the galaxy. So I would love to see that change. I'd love to see, you know, hey, listen, they won't ever touch you unless you declare war with somebody and then the Sentinels are going go, to go crazy on you. But that's my internal lore for them. I, I'm going to pose my, my version. Uh, similar, but different. So what if they yep. were originally set up as some kind of protectors or like, a, like gardener robots, right? Make sure that worlds aren't despoiled, etc. However, what if over time they're breaking down and they're starting to effectively go rogue from the original purpose? This might even lead to a potential synthetic race in a future expansion. <laughs> I'm just so impressed you didn't include dolphins anywhere in that answer. So no, I'd love, good on you. Uh, <laughs> The dolphins are the secret masterminds that could be in the expansion after that one. <laughs> They're the ones that, that made them go rogue and use them as a, as a new threat against the galaxy that united everyone under one cetacean-led empire. Um, but I think it could be kind of cool for as a nice little mechanic for players to think about, hey, listen, I'm not at war with anybody. The Sentinels are going to be just fine with me. I can fly over there. I can colonize that world right beside them. And I'm actually going to use them as defense here um, as compared to if I just start going to war with people, then suddenly, you know, I got to deal with them too. Okay, so uh, Lothurian has a question to ask. Uh, again, you can use Mike or you can just um, post in the questions. Red is also good dolphins now. It's a uh, 
Rob isn't even here, and it's already becoming a, a, a huge topic. Uh, right, so Lutherian, I think this is the question. Uh, like to, says, I like to stick, uh, stick the space monster artifacts in the AI, but I've noticed that they ignore colony ships. What assessments does the AI use for the hostiles to determine targeting? That's a good question, because I've definitely seen the AI grab colony ships, space monsters in particular. If they take a ship, they convert it. And I've seen them convert and have space monster colony ships, and the only way they can do that is by killing one. So I'm surprised by that, actually. Hmm. Uh, Lutheran, do you have a follow-up question? Apart from just commenting, that's weird. Uh, did you... Yeah, I've seen them take planets which caught... I uh, could have forgot about that. Ah, oh, Theon says they'll, uh, they'll do some book hunting. So, um... There were some questions before from Straw Paladin as well about the multiplayer. So, there are like five questions from Straw Paladin. Um, first question is, how soon can we expect the multiplayer to be fixed with the options to not PvP only? Basically, uh, when do bots get added to the multiplayer? Uh, it depends on how quickly we fix those issues. So Carrie is working on it today, and QA is really beating on multiplayer. They were doing the same thing yesterday. So if we get to a place where, yep, it is solid, you know, we can run 100 turns, no problems. It doesn't have to be perfect, but it is definitely better than where it is now, which is, hey, listen, if you play a multiplayer game for 100 turns, you're going to desync. It's 100% guarantee that you will desync once, twice, three times, and that's not good. Um, so letting them get that fixed first. If they get that fixed this week, um, then great. We will feel good for release and then patch one, you know, we'll start to turn on more and more features there. But I'm hoping that by patch one um, or a month after release, we start turning on those other uh, uh, AI, mo other multiplayer modes. It, it was a case of like, um, there were like three options effectively. Either one we release with a, very buggy series of bots that would probably make people frustrated and be like, what is this? Uh, two, we launch with no multiplayer, which would have been just as a frustrating, I think, for different reasons. Or three, we launch with just PvP only, and then as we were able to fix those problems, then we introduce bots and other game modes. That's I just needed which, mm. yeah, to help Carrie to focus, so she wasn't just getting you know 10 different errors, which are unrelated. Hey, listen, let's get this working. Let's take care of these errors once the AI is taken out of the puzzle and get that solid, and then we'll keep adding on more complexity, and she can fix them as they come up. But it's definitely a high priority for us. We're, we're working actively on it today. Uh, I love have... those other gameplay modes. I, I did some uh, player versus player stuff with Ron, but survivor mode, the cooperative, I think is really uh, promising, so I'm excited. So we will not be abandoning that. Those, those modes will be coming back for sure. Uh, uh, Lothurvian has another question. Uh, type it in chat and also go to the second one of Store Paladins, which is, um, has team given any thought to the balance in the starting positions in multiplayer PvP maps? Uh, Store Paladin says that every time they start, uh, they sort of went so far, one guy gets in the middle of the map, and they get to the side of the map. Again, the middle of it can expand in any direction, whilst the other one left in the corner is just struggling. So yes. it... It's actually uh, really easy to... We have kind of this mix. We don't have a map maker where we go in and say where everything is going to be. Instead, we can tell it to randomly generate the map and then put starting points for players in these areas. So it's actually super easy for us to go and make a map that is uh, perfectly balanced for X amount of players. And I think the one that Strahl's probably playing on has five spaces, and they are north, east, south, west, and center. And he's probably right that when you, know, when you get put at some of those places, they're bad. What I need to do, and it's super easy to do, so we may be able to turn it around really quickly, is just make a map that is specific for two players. Perfect, And there's only two starting locations there, and it's going to be you know, point A and point B, and they're balanced. And then three players, and they're perfectly balanced and you know, equidistant from each other and in fair areas of the map, and then four players. That way, you, know, you could pick, based on the amount of players that you have, you can pick uh, you aren't randomly being assigned starting positions because there's only enough starting positions for exactly your player count, and we can make sure that those starting positions are uh, balanced with each other. Okay, uh, so next question is from uh, Divine Wrath. Any clues to who kidnapped the Unmanti? Um, the, oh, no, I'm not giving that away. No, 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 no. <laughs> 
The Mini are my favorite race, by the way, uh, because I love their command ships, that they're all survey ships, and uh, their colors and their ships look super cool. So I do love the Mini a lot. I thought the first one were your favorite. No, I have a Festrin uh, icon here, of course, but um, that's Sarah's token faction. She's, for some reason, convinced that they're the cutest, which says a lot about Sarah. <laughs> I, uh, I do think that who kidnapped the young Manti being an open-ended question allows players to make those decisions when they play games. Um, it you know that that kind of mystery gives you room to tell your own story in the game. Yep. See, now I'm thinking that we need to have an event which every time the game you get that event in the game, it randomly selects one of the factions that they're the ones oh! who kidnap them. Ah, that's super clever. Yep, I like that a lot. By the way, one Festron story uh, about Sarah. For Halloween, she dressed up as a Festron, had a really cool costume that she made herself, uh, and it was really neat. And she she did s- some print offs of Festron faces on like popsicle sticks, like little masks, little paper masks that you could put in front of your face. And she would hand them out to people so that when we were on conference calls on Halloween, you would see Sarah sitting there as a Festron talking on the call. And then every once in a while, you would see other people just start to turn from human to Festron in the, as you're going around the conference call. Like suddenly you're just saying, oh, there's three Festron <laughs> on this call now. Now there's six Festron on this call. What is happening? It was, it was a lot of fun. Very clever idea. Terrifying, just terrifying. I do know that one of um, hmm, I do know that I do know that one of our folks is making a uh, not not a canon one, but like a version like Xenomorph stuff, and that's probably just more of a reskin of Festo, honestly. But uh, I, I, the universe can be full of parasitic aliens soon enough. It's <laughs> it's a problem. So um, next question that was submitted. Um, this is from Larsenex. So, will the upgrade retrofit system in which uh, in which is now in game be changed to be a tad more intuitive? Did you say upgrade system, Henry? The upgrade slash retrofit system. Yeah. So this is like yeah. pre- this also relates to the discussion we had before about um, people learning mechanics, etc., and making stuff more intuitive as well as ex- just don't explain things more. Yeah, we had this plan. We just ran out of time for it to, to include a vault. I know Brad talked about it quite a bit, where you could go and you could see all of the ship components that you had gathered and make better decisions about how you were going, what ships you're going to put them on and how you were going to use them and opening it up so you could upgrade more of your ships. Um, but right now it is there isn't much feedback about it. There isn't any feedback or place for you to go and see, hey, listen, I have, these are what are in my inventory right now that I've collected. I'm going to use these three on this ship and this one on that one. Um, So it is definitely a slim version of the feature. And yes, we would like to implement the full vault where you get to collect more ship upgrades and ship tweaks and you get to use them more globally on your ships uh, as you like, Um, but not something that we'll have for release. Hey, um... Speaking of great and things, uh, we had a question from Lutherian as well about uh, modding, specifically about the animated leader foregrounds. Uh, they said that uh, they can make proper leaders out of what is the, uh, the uh, Bink uh, format, but not the Bink 2 file. And they asked, how does, the, does our art team do it? I don't know. Um, I, I would have to ask one of our art team members on how to do it. I believe... I, I believe this this question, same question, came up around the Gauss of three time period. I think the answer at that time was that you have to have a licensed copy of the of the Bink tool of Rad Tools to be able to do it to make it in this format. Um, I could be wrong. I will check with the art team and see if that's still a necessary requirement. And let you know, Henry. And maybe you can uh, let let the folks know that are interested. Probably a question for Chininja or someone, and just get that into yeah. some kind of part of a the modern guide. Because uh, someone might, might yep. you know, be like, hey, it's worth them if they uh, can invest in the tool and they do it themselves. Um, Absolutely. So, We'd love to see them. Uh, Balsidus asks, um, the, off-main, the off-main defenses are the square, square root right now, uh, but are all three defenses added together? Is it the highest of the three? You get the... F- uh, I believe you get the full of your target of the defense that works and then you get the uh, square of the ones that the square root of your non-optimal defenses but i'd have to actually look at code to see what that is 
Um, <clears throat> not any more questions raised, uh, hands raised at the moment. So uh, let's go back to Store Paladin's questions because we did have quite a few. So <laughs> question number three from Store Paladin. Is there a plan to upgrade the rewards of the precursor relics? The damage that you require to do so, uh, due to them, and the cost it takes to claim them, they seem to be balanced against what you get from those rewards. I agree. I usually leave them alone, because you're absolutely right. They are not worth the investment, at least early on. The goal for them is that this gives you a mid-game thing to go find, to go tackle. Um, I like that they're as tough as they are. It probably means that the rewards need to be boosted for them. So I, th I think he's right. I need to go back and rebalance the rewards that you get from those, because they are really tough to take. One of the many uh, acts of balancing to happen after 1.0 as well. Yeah. Um, so... Never stops. Nope, never stops. Now, this is an interesting question. This is one which um, I am personally investing as well to some degree. Uh, it asks faction specific tech trees. Is this a future wisher somewhere? And this is basically, this is something which uh, Tid really liked from Gus of 2. Probably not, just because it is a lot of work to manage, and we put in tech so that the tech trees can be dynamically changed. And I, I like that as a better option to make sure your tech tree is individual to um, your choices in the game. So I would much prefer, instead of having the Dringen have a whole different tree that belongs to them, but have a series of 8 techs, 10 techs, 12 techs, that are unlocked with the, um, you know, whatever Drench and Trait you have out there, Warrior or what have you. Um, hmm. And, you know, based on their abilities, then everybody has a little bit different tree. And then if you also make a Drengen that is cute and cuddly, and you want to make the good Drengen, and they have different traits, they're not militant, they're not warriors, then their tech tree is going to be a little different. It's going to reflect that too. But that's the direction we're more likely to go in, is making the, the tech tree more dynamic. Even an event that comes up and gives you an opportunity. There's already events that add a couple new techs to the tree, like um, some anomalies where I find a new laser weapon. My choice is I can either strap it on the ship that found it, or I send it to my scientist. And if that happens, then that puts a new tech in my tree that I can research and gives a bonus to all my laser weapons, things like that. So we do a little bit of this, but there's definitely more potential to, to add to that system. Yeah, that is something which I know also from in this space they did as well. Uh, we had like most of the texts were the same, but you have like a couple of prestige texts basically, things which were specific to a race or to we could tie them to ideology. Yeah. Uh, yeah, do all of them. It could be an event that unlocked it. It could be a leader that I've um, hired that unlocked it. It could be um, yeah, the, a racial ability, a civilization ability, or uh, um, ideology, just like you say. Anything Dolphin that makes the is, game different every time I play. Dolphin Tech is all either sonar based or backflips. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> really fancy space maneuvers. Choreographed. Uh, so, um, question, let's see. Anyone with hands up yet? Yes, uh, Lutherian has another question. Uh, Lutherian, where's your question? Uh, I don't see it typed out anywhere. He is mm. typing. Indeed. Um, it's probably a good idea to try to have your question typed out. Yeah. Um, yeah. If you're not going to, if you're not going to ask your it, hand up. Yeah. If you're not going to ask it, uh, like like live to just make sure you type it up, so you'd be like, "Hey, it's over here." Um, yeah. Another question from Store Paladin. Um, Rish, for uh, the, the seven racial balancing, is there a plan to attempt more balance between the races? Some abilities of the computer still doesn't seem to be using properly, like the Biotech Grove ability. The Grove ability, did you say? You mean the score? Yeah. yeah. Um, yes, we'll always be balancing these guys, uh, the races out. Personally, my goal isn't to um, make them all perfectly balanced, but to make them so that I want a player to have that race, uh, that civilization as his favorite. Um, so if somebody's like, I really love playing those guys, they play a little weird, a little strange, that's more important th than them all being perfectly balanced. Um, I want them to feel different when you play them. So like the Mimots, I know the Mimots are super powerful and I uh, tweak some things on them, but I didn't want to take away the thing that made them feel super powerful. So rather than 
you know, take away their two ships for one. It was, you know, let's take away their some of their food on their starting planet and some of the food that they have in their starting um, system so that they get hungry relatively fast, which is what a player should be experiencing when he's playing. So I like doing more things like that. I like the change that we were talking about at Discord this morning, where the Zaloxy could uh, use an executive order and a little bit of control to take a planet that the pirates have, because right now they're at peace with the pirates. And if the pirates steal a planet, the Zaloxy player almost feels like, shoot, now I can't get it because I'm, you know, I'm not at war with the pirates. I can't take it back from them. So they've just effectively taken it from me too. But if you had a little ability to kind of spend a little control and be like, thank you, pirates, I will take that from you, as well as maybe spend a little control and click on a pirate ship and be able to take control of that pirate ship, I think it would feel super good and compelling for the, you know, I'm a bad guy and I'm working with other bad guys. So our little criminal empire, the pirates are just a part of my uh, power reach. So things like that I really want to have. But to answer the initial question, yeah, balance is always going to be happening, but I'm a lot more interested in making sure each of the factions feels special. Yeah, the real danger with balance is that the stronger you lean into it, the more mon monochromatic your factions, your civilizations become. And so we have to we have to balance the balancing as well. Yeah, it's super easy to balance a game. You just make everybody identical, and you're done. That's <laughs> yeah. it. It's good. Mm -hmm. Right, so I'm just looking over questions we have still to go through. Um, we do have some questions about translations. So we've had a couple about specifically Polish and Chinese. But in general, do you want to talk about the current plans of translations uh, just after release and maybe long-term plans as well? What kind of uh, languages are aiming for and how the process that looks like? Yeah. We have um, about them before, but we, we've said that we're doing transitions after the release, so we have a finished version of the text. But uh, I think people also want to get some idea like the timing for that, roughly, and which languages we will be supporting or expect to support at this time. Yeah, uh, you're absolutely right. Like it's just going to be English at release. We're going to get the all the text files out for translation and get uh, German, French, and Russian. And quickly is our plan right now. Um, and then it will just be based on sales to see where we should go in other areas, both of Galsif 4 and taking a look at Galsif 3 and see where it sold and where it didn't sell um, to decide, you know, is it worth translating into these other languages? Galsif, from a text translation perspective, is a massive, massive, massive deal. There is so much text in this game that it's expensive, honestly, and it takes a lot of time to go through all of it. So we have to be careful about what we decide to, uh, what we decide to translate into. Um, just a thought as well, just for, more from myself here, is that um, something I know that's, that, that our community wants us to do is do their own translations and things. Um, what, do we f what do we think about uh, supporting community translations of those people who undertake that kind of, you know, task? Obviously, we, we wouldn't make them official, but like, how viable would you say that is for the community to do? Oh, I, th I think it's a lot easier in Galsif 4 than it was in Galsif 3. One of the things we really would like love to see is to people to be able to go into the workshop. <clears throat> and we could talk about that a little bit too, what that's going to entail, and upload a mod that does translate the game into whatever language they want to. In Galsif 3, the different languages were actually different builds of the game. So if you switched a language, it would have to download all new files for it. In Galsif 4, that isn't the case anymore. All the languages are included. So it's you can switch between languages without having to you know, do a new poll of the game. Um, so a mod that can put in Polish or Chinese or what have you is, is, very, is a lot easier to do. And since the workshop is all included in the game with Galsif 4, and it's not tied to any particular store, um, it would be easy for players everywhere, no matter you know where they got the game, or having to go to a store um, to, to be able to get that mod, to be able to see it right in the game and say, go into the game, go into the workshop, and be like, oh, there's a Polish mod out here. I'm going to click that and install that and run. Uh, right, so we have some people hands raised. Uh, first up is Cyclonus. I'd like to speak. Uh, my question is on hostile entities. Is there any chance we can get them to be buffed up over time so that they have a, an effect during mid and late game? They do buff up over time. They do a couple things right now. They increase the range they're allowed to travel. So their leash is modified as the game goes on. And they do slowly acquire techs. And they're building, actually building their ships in their shipyard. So as they get more techs, they can build more advanced ships. 
and they have a line of ships all the way up to huge ships that could get more terrifying. But I suspect... So all of the functionality is there to be able to support what you're talking about. I suspect it's happening too slowly for it to have any kind of meaningful impact. So when you get to turn 300, for example, their research rate is so slow that you're still seeing you know, them putting out tiny and small ships and nothing that competes with a player anymore. So I should look at that. So like, the a, so like a setting in game that we could have to adjust the rate they level up. Oh, uh, I hadn't thought about that. Um. Because my goal was, and can we get it fixed to where when we click abundant hostile enemies, we get more than three per sector? Because I would like to have 20 to 50 per sector and just be a monster hunter. The Dark okay. Souls of voice games. <laughs> uh, it's the Elden Ring of uh, those games nowadays. <laughs> and Ricky with the times. Well, I need something to well, XP my ships on. Yeah. <laughs> and we need to adjust the XP rate because the XP rate on pirates is extremely low. It's three experience points for one of those tiny um, ships. I've done a lot of testing on those. Always right, but I'm at, like, I like them level up faster so I can fight yeah. medium large ships so they get more XP. Yeah. Um, I don't know about adding an option to control how fast they level up, but uh, checking the balance on them to make sure they are leveling up over the game. And if I do leave that space monster nest alone for too long, then it's going to be problematic for me. Um, it's something that I can absolutely do now. And I all also have a bug on my list for the fact that um, when you're changing those the variants of hostile entities, it isn't doing much unless you turn them off. Because even one step above that to the very rare is still putting three in your sector, I believe, and all the way up to the, the top. I did increase the amount at the top, but it's certainly not that they're having tons like you're talking about there. So maybe I need to play those numbers. Yeah, too. I've tested it multiple times. I get zero on zero setting, and then all the other settings I get three or four max per sector. Yeah. Okay, I'll check, I'll check that out. I do know well, that that slider <laughs> isn't working well. That's good to know that they do upgrade, because, uh, yeah, I just want to be able to fight huge Leviathan ships. I think it'd be fun. Yep. There are some galactic uh, challenges that will give you that opportunity as well. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, next up is uh, Wizards. Hello. Hello. Uh, I had a question regarding... I had noticed in early March that... Uh, Galaxy 3 had shown up on Game Pass. I was wondering if there's plans down the road, like maybe a year, year and a half after launch for Galaxy 4 to maybe show up. And by extension, for uh, other Stardock games to show up on the uh, on the uh, subscription plan, like uh, Sins of a Solar Empire and Star Control. Um, we don't... Sorry, go ahead, Henry. <laughs> He's I was going to cut say, me off and make me say something correct before I say something I'm not supposed to. <laughs> I was just going to say, um, any plans or announcements you might have about that, you'll have to wait to see it, if and when those announcements happen. Uh, when This Q&A is not about anything to do with Game Pass or anything else for that matter of fact. Just Gods yeah. of 4 and our upcoming launch. I'm s uh, I, was also, I also have a comment. This is from 3, but it might apply to 4. Yep. A friend had um, done an exploit, sort of, with spies, where he managed to get spies on capitals via some finagling, and it managed to totally shut down the AI and cut their research. I was wondering if there's any kind of uh, safeguards to prevent that in 4. Uh, so a couple things. One, uh, thank you, Henry, for being a good corporate citizen and keeping me yeah. from saying uh, things I wasn't allowed to say on this call. So that was good. Um, a question for you. <laughs> a question for you. Uh, before I answer your question about the spies, can I just ask what you think of uh, Game Pass? What do you think about uh, Gus of 3 being there? What's your opinion as a player? Well, since I'm one of the people that owns it uh, via Steam, I think it's a good idea to, to see it on game pass because it's a it's a way for people that don't own the game to play it but uh, by extension with the with if there's if the games are coming to the console uh it's a good way to get get people to play it like i know my brother just got a xbox series s and he got game pass because it's a way for him to get a ton of games for free and he might want to he might want to try out star control if it shows up there 
Okay. That makes perfect sense. Thank you. Uh, to your question, uh, the way that spies and espionage works in Gauss Civ 4 is completely changed from Gauss Civ 3. So instead of having a spy that you put on a planet or these uh, citizen that you spend to get these kind of espionage actions, you have leaders. And some of these leaders have special abilities if they're assigned as diplomats. And I can you can assign one diplomat to each uh, other civilization that you know of. Some of the diplomat special abilities are like the embezzler will start to steal some money from the other civilization and give it to you. Um, some of them steal a little bit, or can occasionally steal a tech from the civilization that they're assigned to and give it to you. Some of them will spread a little bit of crime um, to the civilization that they're assigned to or increase um, your culture over that other civilization, things like that. Some of them are actually beneficial. If you have a another civilization in the game that you like and want to be friends with, there are some that will improve the approval of the civilization that they're assigned to. So yeah, do it uh, do it to be nice to them. Give them a nice diplomat that's going to give them perks too. Um, but the system is completely changed, so the, the exploits you're talking about shouldn't apply at all in Gauss 4. Thank you. Thank you. I was, and uh, I was going to ask, maybe I missed it earlier, but uh, what's the news on being able to share mods in the game for a uh, ah. custom civilization? Like, for example, Shizm's uh, Dolphin Race. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's all about the Dolphin Race. Um, I'm glad you asked that. No, it hasn't been asked yet, so it's, it's good that you brought it up. We... Uh, we'll be releasing the workshop on release, so it'll be available next week. We're going to have the ability to share ships, um, absolutely, and we're working right now on getting... So civilizations are in, but it's a little buggy. It's just one of those areas where sometimes you can get uh, messed up. Right now, where it is, to be 100% honest with you, you can create a sieve, you can upload the sieve. We have a couple internal ones that we've made and are up there right now. You can download the sieve. But when you download it, you have to restart the game before you'll see it in your sieve list. So what it's going to happen? What would happen for ninety nine percent of the players out there is they would go because remember this is all in game. You're not going to Steam Workshop or something else. You don't have the game shut down. It's just right there in the game. You go and you could see all of the civilizations that are out there. You click one. Oh, that one looks cool. I want that. You click on it. You hit download, and then you go to the you know start new game screen, and your dolphins aren't there, and you feel like oh this doesn't work at all. So it's just a really bad player experience. Now we could put a tag on it and say, hey, listen, you have to restart before it comes, but we're trying to make sure that this doesn't look too awfully janky. Um, we do have our standards. Everybody in this call is going to be saying, yeah, right, we've, we've seen the early access and the alpha versions of the game. We don't believe you. Um, but we do have our standards, um, so we're trying to get that all kind of ironed out. Right now, the plan is to make sure that you can share ship design. So if you want to go ahead and make your custom sieve and you want to grab some custom ship design some cool stuff that's out there and put into their ship style, you can do that. If you want to make some ship designs and you want to share it, you can do that. And I'm hopeful that we can get Civilizations too. Um, if not, they're going to come soon after release. And then after that happens, we'll start looking at being able sh to share entire ship styles and then being able to, to share entire mods that can make XML changes to the game and do all kinds of crazy things. Um, with regards to like XML changes and things like that, uh, this is just a suggestion from a from a person that has played that plays games. Um, for like the civilizations and ship sets, maybe have when you get to that point, don't have the don't require a game restart. But for the XML changes, you're gonna you're gonna want to put like a notification of some kind, where that in order to use this mod, something like in order to use this mod, the game will require a restart. Yeah, I think you're right. I think that if you are changing the XML stuff for it, unless Carrie has some magic that I don't know of, uh, you're absolutely right that when you're doing those kind of um, total conversion mods, you're probably going to have to restart the game to do it. Or, uh, or if you're playing, uh, if you're joining a multiplayer game and there's a there's an XML mismatch, there should be a way to do a file tran to do an XML transfer of the ones that are not matching because I've done this in other games where i've had to spend 20 or more minutes trying to get trying to manually change the files that were modified yeah so have a way to transfer the files over and maybe automatically create the mod folder if it's uh if it's uh directly direct game edit like make a i don't know like d default date 
uh, folder that's got that uses the files? Yeah, we already do something like that for if one player has a bunch of ships that the other one doesn't have, we send the ships across. Galsiv 3 did this, so it would wrap up your custom civilization and stuff, and those would all be synced before the game starts, which is why a lot of times you start a multiplayer game in Galsiv 3, it uh, takes a long time because it's sending all this data back and forth. We made a big change in multiplayer for Galsiv 4 to make it more resilient. Uh, which is everything's running now on the host machine and Galsiv 3 used to run the game simultaneously on every player's machine and then they would stay in sync by cha- by sending the uh, change events between them, which was very fragile and required everybody to have all of the data. In Galsiv 4, it should be easier to do that. Um, I don't know how exhaustive the modding is going to work in multiplayer in Galsiv 4. Uh, playing as your the faction, the civilization that you've created is certainly doable, but um, I don't know how elaborate we're going to be able to to get that to work without multiplayer blowing up. Some discussion I'm seeing in the no, the Nomad chat here, and just to clarify something, is that people sometimes hear workshop and they think of Steam Workshop. Uh, in the concept we're talking about, um, the way that we're going to handle mods is through our own internal system. So this will be completely independent of Steam, of Epic, of anything else. So it, you won't need to go through any, like, one of the issues I think that people have, find more and more these days is that if they get a game uh, on one place or something and they're trying to get mods or whatever, it can become an issue of, like, where you download that or, like, what versions you're, you're syncing. Even someone like The Witcher 3, for instance, they have it whereby the version for GOG versus Steam is different for mods. Uh, we're trying to avoid all of that, making everything as internal and as kind of consistent across wherever you buy and play our games. So. It's 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 not Steam. It's not like uh, Epic or anything else like that. It it is purely our own internal system which we are developing, which is part of the reason why it's going to be a little bit um, in progress as well as, as we go forward. But this is what we're developing, not just for Galsiv, but for all of our future games uh, in regards to the way that you do modern and download and update things. Yeah, it's kind of a shame that we have Galsiv three on Epic right now, but there's no you know workshop content there are, uh, I, I forget what there was last time like 20,000 uh, pieces of user created content that's available on Steam for Galsiv 3 and that just isn't available there on Epic so that's disheartening um, so we don't but, want ourselves to be tied to any store like that so this is such a better system for long term yeah it, it's it's a cool system but then you have it whereby people on GOG or Epic or anywhere else they, they just can't use that at least not in the same way um so, uh, we do have one more question, and we're coming to the hour mark here. But uh, thank you, Wizard. Um, moving back to the audience. And that's from Sci Fi 1950. Uh, if I just speak, you can use Mac if you want, or can ask a question from the questions channel. Is my mic working? Yes. So, I, I was just curious on the custom sieves. Uh, any plans to give some additional features there rather than? having to go and tweak XML files, such as maybe access to picking factions or tweaking the home system, things like that? You can pick the home system right now. You can pick what you, type of planet they have. Right. You can pick the, from the list, but you can't make one up. Oh, I see. I, I understand. Um, probably not that. Um, that would be pretty... There's a lot pretty of hard. complexity that goes yeah. into making those things. Um, but. Uh, in the patch that we just put out there in 095, you can put in flavor text for them. So that is up right now. We're looking at being able to select portraits, citizen portraits for them. Um, that will come out after release. So if you're making your dolphin civilization, you can have all of your dolphin unit portraits. So all of your leaders are dolphins too. And all your citizens on all your worlds are all dolphins. Um, without having any kind of XML or anything, you can do it right there in the editor. So that is planned to come and being able to pick um, factions uh, as well. What are the four factions that this uh, civilization uses? By the way, a million times on this call, I've been saying faction, 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 because that's what we call it internal. Whenever I say that, I'm typically talking about civilizations, except in this case. Uh, when I talk about races too, this race, that race, that's old, Galsip, just because I'm used to it from Galsip 3, that's what we typically would internally call civilization. So. I'm sorry so, for the confusion there. That, yeah, it's fine. So after release, you're going to add the ability to pick what factions your civilization has access to? Yes. Okay, cool. That's all I had. Okay. Oh, all right. 
No follow up question? Just okay. Uh, <laughs> the audience, uh, thank you. Uh, I, that actually brings us to the hour mark for this. Uh, was there any final comments, either yourself, Derek, or uh, Chad had for our audience? I don't think so. I wanted to talk about the workshop that's coming, so I'm glad that um, we got a question out about that. Um, we have uh, you know a lot to do before Tuesday, but we're excited. If you haven't tried the 0 0.95 beta that's on test right now, please try it out. It has the uh, as well as some balance tweaks and some new features. It also has the new intro, which is amazing. The art team did such a great job on it, a new uh, splash screen for it, which turned out really good. So very proud of all the work that the artists have done. So you'll want to check that out. All right, and uh, Chad. I just wanted to thank everybody for coming. We really appreciate it. We really appreciate the support we've got so far. The community for Galsiv, I'm, I'm new to Galsiv, and the community is just great. I've been really impressed with uh, how cooperative they are and, and how interested they are in the game. So it's it's been great. Yeah, uh, I think we say that every almost every time, but to, uh, generally one of the things that um, motivates the team and is able to help guide and direct things is the fact that we do have such a good community and people here are not, I mean, not, it, it almost feels every time I say this, like I'm trying to like talk bad about other communities. I'm not. It's just that there's a tendency, especially I think amongst um, games in general, people to get very like agitated and very passionate sometimes, shall we say, about things. Uh, not always constructive, but uh, we do consider ourselves fortunate to have a pretty good and constructive community that, um, you know, sometimes it tells us when we get things horribly wrong and it, and it hurts, but... On the long term, that is how you get a good game, and even a great game, quite possibly. Yeah, it's, so. you can't undersell the amount of uh, change that, especially the people on that are listening right now, have made to making this a much better game, and have um, convinced me out of things. Like I, when you start a game design, like you have all these ideas, and it all sounds great, and then talking to the players here, like, oh, I understand what you're saying. It so it's definitely changed our direction and made the game much better at the end. So any of the community feedback and support is, is always appreciated. All right. So as always, uh, thank you everyone for coming to our Q and A. Uh, we may have another one sometime after release, but probably after Derek and everyone has had time to hibernate for like at least six months. Uh, <laughs> Uh, remember to check us out on gossip4.com. Uh, we will be releasing in 1.0 very, very soon. And as Derek mentions, uh, 0 0.95 is currently out. It is on the test branch, so check that out. Um, keep those sit-ups coming in. Those are very useful for us. And we'll see you all next time.